December 9th, 1965. That's, that's today. What, 53 years ago? <laughs> right? That's when, that, that's when that aired. It aired in the United States on uh, CBS, which is one of the national um, channels in the U.S. And uh, when it aired, there was some concern about whether or not it was going to be well-received. Uh, Coca-Cola, actually, was the one who put it out, believe it or not. There were portions of that, of that show, which I'm sure you've all shown to your children, and you've seen several times yourself, there are portions of it, actually, that were like blatant advertising for Coca-Cola. Snoopy, at one point, apparently ran into a sign that says, drink Coke, right? Um, but they, they edited all that out so that we don't uh, experience it that way anymore. They were really concerned, the, the people who put it together, uh, especially the, the network and Coca-Cola, were really concerned with that section right there in this, in, in this show because it was kind of the only time in the mid-60s where somebody would be in, in a popular television program um, reading scripture of that kind of length. I mean, it's from, it's from the King James Version. Linus gets up and he, he answers the question that Charlie Brown has. What is Christmas, what, what, what is Christmas all about? Um, people were concerned, uh, the advertisers and others, that this is going to turn off a big section of the population, but it didn't. Half of the United States population watched that show. Half. Like, it was huge. Huge. Uh, and we watch it today, right? I mean, um, I watch it every year with my kids. I'm sure that you've seen it several times. I've had everybody raise their hand. I'm, everybody's seen the Charlie Brown Christmas. Everybody, at some point or another, has been to some dance somewhere and tried to do the dances of the Charlie Brown Christmas. Yes? Yeah, right? <laughs> this one and... This one? Yeah, you're welcome. That's all you're going to get. <clears throat> when you go and get your tree every year, you might, I, the running joke that I have with my family is uh, if it's my turn to choose the tree, I always say, oh, we're getting a Charlie Brown tree. I'm just going to find the bush out front there. And that's the one we're going to, Dad, no. Nope, that's what we're getting. No, it's cheaper. No, the true, true meaning of Christmas, kids. Right? It's part of our, our cultural language, Right? Um, I, I spoke to a guy a number of years ago who said that he grew, up, he, he grew up not around the church at all, and the only piece of scripture that he ever had known prior to coming to church was from that, from that play or from that uh, show. This section in Luke chapter 2, which of course is the story of, of, the, of the birth of Christ and how it's announced to the shepherds in the midst of a field. It ends, and the reason I showed it to you is, is it ends with these, these lines in Luke chapter 2, verse 13. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on, on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now when you and I hear that, um, we think that what he's talking about, that Jesus is going to come and he's going to bring peace to us. And what we think that means is like good feelings, the kind of peaceful feelings I have when I'm sitting by the fireplace and all the Christmas stuff is done and I've wrapped all the presents and it's Christmas Eve and it's snowing outside and all is right with the world and the kids are all asleep. That kind of peace, that kind of inner peace. But that's probably not what's being announced to these shepherds in this moment. They're announcing that there's going to be there's glory to God in, in heaven and on earth, peace among men and women on whom his favor rests. Me meaning that what Jesus does is he comes to bring, in the Hebrew language, a shalom. He comes to bring a wholeness to our relationships. He comes to actually create a body of people who will be marked by the peace that they have with one another in such a way that the rest of the world is going to look at them and think, look at how they love one another. Look at how much peace they have among one another. Man, I want to have a part of that. It's like a taste of heaven. I want to have a part of that. So Christmas, <laughs> the incarnation of Jesus, or they coming from heaven to earth, is supposed to lead us to a kind of Peace, Christ in that sense is our peace, not just inwardly, but the way we demonstrate it with each other. How does that happen? How, how, how does that kind of peace happen? And how specifically does Jesus coming from heaven to earth 
motivate us to that kind of peace. So that's what I want to talk about here. In, uh, in, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, Paul actually takes up that question. He's dealing with, with how um, Christ is our peace with one another, and how do we stay that way? I'm actually going to cite the, 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 the incarnation, the story of Jesus coming from heaven to earth to talk about that. So here, in this passage, you have Bible. You can turn it to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 to 11 here in the next few minutes. Uh, in it, we're going to kind of use these as our headings, okay? First of all, Christ is the source of our peace. Second, there is a threat to our peace. And then third, the motivation. I want to give motivation for more peace. So the source of our peace, the threat to our peace, and finally, the motivation for more peace. Here's the first of those, the source of our peace. So Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Now, I want you to notice at the beginning of that passage, in the first verse, he's, he's listing out some benefits that are yours. If you're a Christian, if you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, and you express that to him, you're saved, and there are some benefits that you have for becoming part of Christ's family. And he lists them there, right? Encouragement from united with Christ, comfort from his love, common sharing in the spirit, tenderness, and compassion. A number of years ago, I was actually uh, interviewing a, at a church. It was a time in my life where I was, didn't have a ministry, and uh, the Lord had opened up a door for me to, to perhaps work as an associate pastor of a church in, in San Jose, California. I went, it was a great weekend, uh, I remember going there and playing in, uh, they had a church softball team, and uh, I led in the winning run by not catching the ball in the outfield, so that was really great. Uh, the church was not happy. It was actually funny. I was interviewing there, and this was on a Saturday, and like none of the guys from the church wanted to talk to me after that. It's probably why I didn't get the job in the end. But one of the things that they wanted me to do is to connect with a lot of the new believers they had in their church. For whatever reason, this particular church had so many people who had just come to faith in Christ. And they said, listen, what we need is we need an associate pastor who's going to come and disciple these people. So what we want you to do is to go and have dinner with a few of them, just get to know them and see how they feel about you and you about them and see if this is a match. So we did. We had, went and had some great um, Mexican food, and the people who were sitting across the table from us were from various backgrounds. One guy's all got mass, all sorts of tattoos, and he comes from a gang background. Another guy was in the business sector, San Jose, right? So the Silicon Valley, he is, was an atheist who came to faith in Christ over a long period of time. These two ladies had some very, very different sketchy backgrounds of their own. They kept telling us, regaling us with stories about their upbringing and how it is that they came to faith in Christ in tears, saying, oh, Jesus, save me. I'm so thankful. One of these ladies, kind of halfway through, while they're all laughing and talking amongst each other about how great it is to be a Christian, she turned to me, looked me in the eye, and she said, you have no idea, pastor. She's, this woman's been a Christian for like, I don't know, 18 months at this point. You have no idea, pastor, how much we have as Christians. Now, that, that, that struck me at the moment because I, I've been in the Christian faith since I was like 16. And if you've been around something, sometimes familiarity either breeds contempt or indifference or whatever. You just get used to it. You just get used to being around Christian people. You get used to being the beneficiary of all these things that Jesus has done for you. What Paul's trying to do here is basically sit across you with tears in his eyes and say, you don't know what you've got, Christian. It's huge benefits to being a believer in the Lord Jesus. What are they? Well, I mentioned them. Encouragement from being united with Christ and comfort from his love. So in other words, Christians, we're not dour. We face the same suffering everybody else in the world faces. We face death and financial hardship and relational turmoil and all that kind of nonsense. We live in the same fallen world everybody else does. And we mourn. We grieve. Last week I talked about how we groan inwardly. As it's like a woman 
giving birth to a child. That's that kind of deep-seated groaning. We have all of that, but not without hope. That's, that's different. It's one thing to groan and have no hope. It's another thing to groan and know that this is not always the way it's going to be. It affects the way we view our current circumstances. Should, anyway. So, I got an email from uh, my father-in-law. who's a pastor for, I don't know, 35 years or so. And he sent me an email when I was kind of getting started in ministry. And he, he wrote on the top of the email, he said, uh, Jeff, this is what a true Christian looks like. So it was, it was an email from a friend of his who'd been part of his church for years and years. And this woman, her name is Nancy, uh, she had contracted cancer, and it was at a very late stage. So the, the prospects were very poor. Here's what she wrote to her friends and family. She said, hi, all. <clears throat> Time for an update. I've had a wonderful two extra weeks of freedom from all the drugs they pump into me. I thought uh, that I was to start a new round of drugs yesterday, but there were some scheduling difficulties, and so Thursday will be my first day. They're going to use two drugs on me. This Thursday, I'll get the first one. The following Thursday, I get the second, and then I get a week off. And after this, they're going to take another lung scan and see how things are going. If my lungs are the same or they seem to be better, then I'm going to continue with the treatment. If they're worse, then we will stop. And to quote the doctor, Hopefully, there'll be something else out there to try by then. Encouraging, eh? The side effects will pretty much be the same. Fatigue, low blood counts. One drug causes numbing in the hands and feet, which may or may not go away after the drug is stopped. If the cancer is gone, it'll be worth it. I've learned more about my cancer in the meantime. Uh, it comes in two types. The other type responds much better to treatments. Mine does not. It's much harder to get rid of. I didn't know that. But one thing I do know is that God knows all of this, and nothing is too big for him. He's God. He has a plan for me. And right now, this is his plan for me, to go through this. I don't know what his will is for me long term, but no matter what, he loves me, and he's in control. That's my comfort, and he's my strength. So continue to pray for wisdom for my doctors. And of course, we're praying that God's will for me is to be healed and him glorified. Love, Nancy. So you don't, listen, you don't get that kind of vibe from somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus, who doesn't have hope for the future. When they're facing a thing like cancer, it's like, the worst possible outcome possible. And yet, we Christians, yes, it's awful, and cancer's terrible, and it kills way too many people, and yet it's not the last chapter of the story. I get asked from time to time to speak at funerals, uh, not frequently because I'm a bit of a firebrand, and uh, I, got asked, um, I got asked by a friend to speak at their funeral because I am a firebrand, and this woman, she said to me, listen, um, my husband's family is going to be coming from all over, and they're all a bunch of secularists, meaning that they don't believe that there's any heaven or hell or immaterial world. They're basically real science people, right? And so she said, what I'd really like you to do is challenge them. And I said, really? You sure you want me to challenge them? It's your funeral? She said, no, that's exactly what my husband would have wanted. He would have wanted all of these people to get in a room. He spent most of his life challenging these people. See, he wants you. I'm sure he would want you to let them have it. And I was like, oh, let them have it. Anyway, <laughs> so time came for me to speak at this funeral. And there sitting in the room is a room filled with people. I knew the husband, a dear, dear man. It was filled with people. And uh, many of them traveled from long way off and didn't believe in God. Some of them were like, this is the first time I've been in church in the last, you know, 50 years or something like that. I left it behind because it's all a bunch of nonsense. So here's what I said. I said, here's what I want to challenge you to think. That you have, a, you have a grieving widow and a bunch of children here. And afterwards, you're going to go over into the other room 
And they're going to give you the sandwiches with the mustard on them. And you're going to stand there with that and a little fruit square on your plate. And you're going to go through a line and you're going to walk up to this grieving widow and you're going to try to offer her some kind of condolence in this one of life's most difficult moments, facing the very thing that all of us will face, death. And what do you have to say here? See, if you're a Christian in this moment, you can come up and you can say to her, dear sister, I am so sorry for your loss. Your husband was a great, great man. And I am looking forward to the day that I will sit by a lake in heaven with him and talk to him for ages and that you will see him again and we will be reunited in Christ. You can say that. You can say this is not the last chapter of the story. But if you're a secularist, if you believe that the only thing that there is in the world is material stuff, then he is really sitting in a grave, rotting. And this is it. And what are you going to say now to her? You don't have any hope. Stop pretending that the next sports win is going to provide all that you need. It's not going to happen. See, this is why people don't ask me to do the funerals. (laughs) But Christian, you do hear what I'm saying there, don't you? Like, you have comfort from his love. You have encouragement from being united with Christ. He also says here that you have common sharing in the spirit and tenderness and compassion. You see that in verse one there? He's probably, Paul's probably referring to the blessings that are yours because you're part of the Christian community there, right? The, the tenderness and compassion are things that others show to you. You, you. you have a part in tenderness and compassion. You receive the compassion of others in the midst of your difficult circumstances. That there is a great blessing, in other words, Paul is saying, of being part of the Spirit's work in the church. So um, there's a story where Jesus speaks to a rich ruler. A rich young guy comes up to Jesus, and uh, Jesus tells him, you need to give all, all, all your money away. It's basically in the way of you serving me. It's, it's your true God. So let's put, put your commitment to me to the test. Go and give away all your money, and then come follow me. And the guy's like, I can't do that. The money's too, it's too important to me. So he walks away sad. And Jesus says, man, how hard is it for a, for a rich guy to get, to get into the kingdom? And Peter is sitting there, and he's listening to all that. And he, and he jumps in, as Peter often did. Jumps in, and he says, but Jesus, we've given up everything to follow you. Listen to what Jesus says. Luke 18, verse 28. Peter said to him, we've left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. So there's two things that you get. You give up everything to follow Jesus. And in some cases, that means your parents are going to turn their back on you. If you're from a Muslim background or from some kind of Hindu background, they might actually decide you're not our child anymore. So what do you do in that situation? Jesus says, well, if you don't hate your father and mother, you can't be my disciple. That's what he means. That your allegiance needs to be placed solely in me. And nothing can bar you from, from coming. And so you're going to give up everything, everything you've got to follow Jesus. And Peter's like, we, we did that. We left our nets and followed you. We don't have anything. What about us? What, what do we get? And Peter, Jesus says, there's two things you get. You get eternal life. But in this age, all the family that you you gave up are now now replaced. Your biological family is now replaced by your spiritual family. What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about the person sitting next to you. He's, He's talking about the church. He's talking about what's going to happen when you leave these things behind. You join this new body of people, and the church is that body of people. And listen, if you've ever been in a deep moment of distress in your life, I can tell you right now that you have been deeply thankful that you have a church. 
that your brothers and sisters take you under their wing and they bring you meals and they try to help you as best they can. And yes, they fail and fall down as, as often sometimes as they help, but there is a community of people around you who are, who are there to help. And they will be there to help. And the last sermon I ever preached when I was, I, in order to go to New Zealand, we had to sell everything. Remember, we had like eight boxes that we placed underneath my parents' house. And then we left to go to New Zealand. We didn't know anybody there. Got off the plane, these, these dear people, Colleen and Hudson were their names. Uh, they took us under their wing. They let us stay in their house on the top of this hill. My son, Ethan, was two years old at the time, and he would run around their house terrorizing their fish. They had these fish in the pond, and he would try to grab them by the tail, and they were like, oh, leave the fish alone, you know? <laughs> they oversaw the, the airport, and so was this man Hudson, who would get up, my son would get up early, and I was like, this is awful. You know, leave behind your family and stuff. You're like, who's ever going to help with us? Hudson used to take my son Ethan and sit outside early in the morning, and they would sit and they'd look at the planes, and he'd talk to him about the planes for like an hour. It's like a surrogate grandfather. We stayed there for a number of months, and then we ended up moving into our own place, but that wasn't the end of our relationship with them or with others. The other pastor in the church was an older, one of the older, an older gentlemen, and he decided, he and his wife decided that they were going to be the grandparents to my kids. They would invite them over. They'd tell my wife and I, you need to go and, on a holiday, or you need to go away for a while. We're going to look after your children's love, like, love on them like crazy. Had friends there who honestly became my children's aunties and uncles and all, all, the, all these sorts of things. When I, when I left there, I remember the last day, I had to fly away in the afternoon, and I told them on my last sermon, right, so I got to leave here at like 3 o'clock, and right now it's 11, so I got four hours to, to give you this message. They all kind of freaked out. I was like, this might be a while, so settle in, you know? But what I talked about to that church was how that how they had embodied that passage, how they had become sisters and brothers and aunties and uncles and mommies and daddies, both to me and to my children. Every place I've ever gone in the world and I've done ministry, the beauty of it all is I get to engage with brothers and sisters in Christ. And there is a deep joy in being part of the Christian community. Do you have any idea what you've got, Christian? Encouragement from the United with Christ, comfort from his love, tenderness and compassion, sharing in the spirit. The point here is that there are these massive benefits to being a Christian, but Paul's point here is, look, look that's, the, that's the source of our peace. We share in all this together. But there are implications to that sharing. You notice what he says in verse two, then make my joy complete. Like if you have all of this stuff, if you've been graced with all these things, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. In other words, if you've received the benefits of Christ's work, then you should share the benefits of Christ's work. Uh, imagine, I think I've used this illustration before. But imagine that you have children and you have an older one and you have a younger one and you go to the McDonald's to get the French fries and you know you do it. You try to hide it from people, but you go to the McDonald's to get the French fries. Don't you worry. You know. Oh, I've seen you there, right? <laughs> so you're in the McDonald's drive through and you're getting the French fries because you want to give the kids a little treat and you get to the get the french fries. You get the big one, of course, because you're like, well, I don't, I don't want to buy like two separate ones, even though that would be uh, pragmatically smart for you to do because there's two children in the back and they might fight. You said, no, I'm going to get the one big one cheaper. And I'm more Mennonite than I am pragmatic. So I'm just going <laughs> to give the fries in the back to the kids. You give it to the older one because you're freaked out that the younger one's just going to throw it out the window, you know? So here's the, you give it to the older one, the older one's sitting there with the hot fries, big, thing, big, it's half the size of them right? And they're holding these fries. You give these and you share some with your little sister, little brother. Okay. Kids in the back and you're driving away and it's not very long before you hear little one say, can I have some fries? And the older one say, no, I'm not done yet. Can I, but I'm supposed to share. No, I'm not done yet. Leave. And they start reaching, get your hands off my fries. Now, if the older one's doing this, what do, you, what do you say to them? You need to share the fries. No, I can't. They're my fries. Then you pull over as a parent and you you get out of the car and you walk to this side. You give me those fries. 
And you say, whose fries are these? Whose fries? <laughs> they're yours. Right, they're my fries. To me, giving it to you is an act of grace. I handed them to you. Do you deserve fries? No. I've been with you all week. It's not been a good fry week. I gave you the fries out of grace. And now you're withholding them from your little brother, your little sister? Are you kidding me? What you receive by grace, you pass on by grace. This is what Paul's saying here. Not, not about the fry. <laughs> you see his point, though? Like, look, if you have all these blessings that you've been given, to, given by God, then those blessings should form a kind of attitude in you. You should make his joy complete by being like-minded. Passing it on to, to those around you. The peace that you've received from Jesus should be the peace that you and I demonstrate with each other. Yes? It's the source of our peace, but there's a threat to it. It's a threat to our peace. Verse three, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So there's a background to this historically. Uh, the, the Philippian church was a, a really good church, one of Paul's favorites. Paul's in prison when he's writing this. And when you're in prison in the Roman world, you have to have people who provide for you or you'll die. They didn't give you like three meals a day and give you like yard time and stuff like that. You were in a hole in the ground. And if people didn't give you uh, blankets and provide for your food, you, you, you would die. So you needed friends who were gonna give you gifts. Well, this church in Philippi had sent their, their little uh, friend uh, Epaphroditus, and they sent with him basically a financial contribution to take care of Paul while he was in prison. When Paul gets this gift, he sits down and he writes this letter. And it's, a ba it's basically a thank you letter. Thank you for the money. He's a missionary in prison saying, thank you for looking after me and sharing in my suffering. In, in, so, so they're a great church. They're like a real model church in this way. They're really giving and they're facing the suffering in their community really well. Like from the outside, the community is starting to, starting to look really down on them and they're trying, starting to um, oppress them, but they're remaining faithful. But Paul's like, but there's a problem. I can see it on the horizon. As good a church as you are in this present moment and as good as things are going on, over the horizon, I see some problems surfacing. Namely, you guys are kind of fighting with each other. Apparently, Paphroditus, when he came and Paul said, hey, how are things going in the church in Philippi? Paphroditus said, yeah, pretty good, except there's a couple of these ladies who are really getting upset with each other. Paul writes about it in Philippians 4, verse 2. I plead, he says, with Yodia and Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement, the rest of the co-workers whose names are in the book of life. So these, these two ladies who are having a go at each other, we don't know why, no idea. But Paul's basically saying, look, the church is going really well, but it's, there's a threat to the church, and that is you guys are not getting along. And this little fight that you're having, these seeds of dissension could bloom into flowers of disunity that will destroy everything. And that's the way you ruin churches, guys. As you enthrone your opinion, you've been wronged in some way, you perceive it to be so, you enthrone your opinion, and then you, you go to war. It's not just in the church that happens. I mean, like, have you ever been a part of a sports team where you've had a little bit of a fight between a couple of the players and then the team was winning for a while and all of a sudden the players are fighting with each other on the floor. You know, it's basketball. They won't throw the ball to each other. No, I hate you. You stole my girlfriend. Whatever it is, you know. And the team all of a sudden starts losing. All of us have been on this team before. Your workplace, you ever had a workplace fracture where there's somebody that you just don't get along with or they've done something to you that has not been resolved and so every time you walk by their desk, your stomach kind of tightens. You do whatever you can to avoid them. And the company was doing really well business-wise, but now there's so much fracture within that they can't produce what it is that they were producing before because of what's going on inside. 
So it is with the church. There's a guy a number of years ago who wrote this uh, blog post. He called it the anatomy of a church conflict. So in other words, here's eight steps to how church conflicts happen. This guy had been a pastor for something 40 years or so. Here's what he said. Number one, an offense occurs. Somebody's been wronged or perceives themselves to be wronged. Number two, a biased view of the offense is shared with friends. Right? You're not chari- when you go share it with your friends, what happened to you, you're not being charitable to the other side. What you want your friends to do is come to your side, and of course they do, and that's why number three happens. Friends take up the offense. I mean, they like you. They want to be on your team. Number four, sides begin to form because that other person was doing the same thing about you and they've been forming their side and now you've got two sides starting to grow in the church. Number five, exaggerated statements are made. Those involved hear things that were never said and say things they wish they had never said, right? So it just grows and grows and blossoms like that. Number six, past offenses unrelated to the original offense surface. You know, I'm not surprised to hear that he's such a jerk because four years ago when I was sitting there in the front row of the church, he looked at me in a jerkish sort of fashion. (laughs) He's a jerk. I thought then that he was a jerk and now it's just sure. Number seven, those who try to solve the problem, usually church leaders, are blamed for not following proper procedure and become the new focus of anger. But people who try to step in, it's like breaking up a fight. You try to step in and all of a sudden people are hitting you. What am I doing? I just try to solve the problem. No, you did it wrong. (laughs) And then finally, eight, everything blows up and people choose not to speak to each other ever again. Listen, can I tell you, I've been a pastor for 20-something years. I've seen this happen repeatedly in churches I've been a part of. If, If you want to blow up a church, just enthrone your opinion and go to war. Take that offense, don't show grace about it, take that offense and in principle dig your heels in and pull out your guns. So let me give you some motivation for more peace then. All right, so so if there's a threat, here's some motivation for how we can have more peace and not live like that. In our church, in our families, Here we go. Look at verses five and following. In your relationships with one another, writes Paul, uh, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Well, okay, what what kind of mindset are we talking about? Now, he's going to quote an ancient hymn here. And in it, he's going to point out two big things. So what should your mindset be? Well, it should be that of Christ Jesus. Well, what was Jesus' mindset? Well, think about what it took for Jesus to come from heaven to earth, right, Christmas, and then think about what it took for Jesus to come from, go from earth to the cross, Easter. So I want you to think about Christmas, and I want you to think about Easter, says Paul. First, Christmas. Your mindset should be the same as Christ Jesus, verse 6, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human Likeness. He, in other words, he emptied himself, and that means to make yourself nothing. He traded, Jesus traded his unity, his experience, his everything that he had with God in heaven, in the, tr- in the Trinity, and he came to earth, making himself nothing, so that instead of having that fellowship, he is now dumb as us. Now, now look. There have been theologians who've tried to make sense of this for a lot of years. This is, it's a miracle. The incarnation is a miracle. Let me give you a couple of tries here. Uh, one from C.S. Lewis. Lewis wrote, lying at your feet is your dog. Imagine for the moment that your dog and every dog is in deep distress. Some of us love dogs very much. If it would help all the dogs in the world to become like men, would you be willing to become a dog? Would you put down your human nature, leave your loved ones, your job, hobbies, your art, literature, and music, and choose instead of the intimate communion with your beloved, the poor substitute of looking into the beloved's face and wagging your tail, unable to smile or speak. Some husbands are actually like this, but you get the idea. I mean, he's, okay, Lewis, uh, 
That makes kind of sense, but the question is, is the gap that exists between human beings and dogs as great as the gap that exists between God and human beings? Uh. So here's Philip Yancey's try at it. I share this, lots of Christmases, a great quote. He says, the God who roared, who could order armies and empires about like pawns on a chessboard. This God emerges in Palestine as a baby who couldn't speak or eat solid food or control his bladder, who depended on a teenager for shelter, food, and love. Once, when I was in London at a performance of Handel's Messiah, I looked toward the auditorium's royal box where the queen and her family sat, and I caught glimpses of the more typical way rulers stride through the world. They have bodyguards, trumpet fanfare, and a flourish of bright clothes and flashing jewelry. Queen Elizabeth II had recently visited the United States, and reporters delighted in spelling out the logistics involved. Her 200 kilos of luggage included two outfits for every occasion, a mourning outfit in case someone died, 40 pints of plasma, a white kid leather toilet seat covers. She brought along her own hairdresser, two valets, and a host of other attendants. A brief visit of royalty to a foreign country can easily cost $20 million. But in meek contrast, God's visit to earth took place in an animal shelter with no attendants present and nowhere to lay the newborn king but a feed trough. Indeed, the event that divided history and even our calendars into two parts may have had more animal than human witnesses. An animal... A mule could have stepped on him. On God. A mule could have stepped on God. See, Paul's point here is this, look, you, you just, when you look at the Christmas, you, it reeks of humility, yes? That's a long way to go from heaven to earth. But he didn't stop there. The humility of Jesus coming that distance to restore a relationship didn't stop just by becoming a baby He ended up going to a cross, and that's what he says in verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You guys, the, the crucifixion process among the Romans was... Crazy violent. The whole thing was done usually to shame dissidents. So if you had an issue against the Roman government and you voiced it publicly and maybe even took up arms against them, the way that they would respond would be by crucifying you publicly. And the reason they did it publicly is so that everybody else could see what they do to dissidents. So if you have any ideas in your head about I'm going to be a rebel against the government. Hey, guys, this is what Rome does to rebels. Well, what is it that they do? Well, the the process of crucifixion begins with a scourging. They call it the flagellum. They take this whip that has nine tails on it, and at the end of each one of the tails, they put little shards of bone and rock, real sharp things, and and, and one of the guards will whip the body, put the body of the person up against a pole, and they will whip the body. And the idea was that these nine lashes come around the side, and they stick to the body, and then you yank it off so that the, so that the flesh of the body comes, comes off. You do this several times. Some people die at this particular point because of the trauma, but you didn't want the people to die. You wanted them to stay alive so that you could put them on the cross publicly and humiliate them. So then you give the, the you know, the cross has a, has, a, has a vertical beam and a horizontal beam. You give that vertical beam to the person. They have to carry it to the place of their own execution, usually on a main road somewhere. The idea here was that they would have to walk through crowds of people who would jeer at them in front of the victim carrying the cross, in front of them was usually a person who was announcing their crime. So in Jesus' case, king of the Jews, a dissident to Rome, claims he's bringing another kingdom. This is what we do to people who claim other kingdoms. When you get up there to the top of the hill, 
or whatever the main road is, uh, you are dropped into, you're fastened to the cross beam, usually by nails. Interestingly, a lot of the nails went into the arm and not the wrist. We're not totally sure that the nails went into the wrist of Jesus, but somewhere along the arm and held them up on there. There was usually a seat placed on the cross right underneath the bum. And the idea was so that you could actually last longer. You're naked up there, you're defecating yourself, and, and the idea is that people can walk by and see and make fun and mock. They put the sign on the top of your head that said your crime. Once when the Romans uh, took over a particular land, they crucified 6,000 people along the main road going into the city just to show everybody else who might have thoughts of, of rebellion that this is what's going to happen to you. So here's my question. If you made the mouths of men and women, would you allow them to mock you on that cross? If you formed, if you formed their hands, would you allow those hands to nail you to that cross? If with one thought you could bring the entire, entire army of heaven upon the moment, you could disband the molecules of the body of those who are persecuting you, would you have endured that suffering? So here's the point. You do see how far Jesus came in order to restore a relationship that was fractured, yes? How far are you and I willing to go then? Th those who've been graced, who've received the fries, how far are you willing to go then to restore? Peace on earth and goodwill among those on whom his favor rests. Let me pray. Father, I'm thankful for your grace and for your word. I ask that you would help us to see that this time is not, this time of the year is, is certainly about the peace that you bring to our hearts, but more than that, it's about the peace you bring to our lives. So God, I pray that you would help us, as far as it depends on us, to live at peace with all people. Some of us in the room, I know, Lord, uh, have issues with others, and uh, they have not gone the distance yet. And I pray, Father, that you, by the power of your Spirit, would press them to do that very thing for your glory and for our ultimate good as your church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.